past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back, everybody. Yeah, just looking over a lot of material, and you know what? Uh, I feel really bad for people. We're gonna. I I hope we have a good show today. I I like the material that we're covering. Uh, but while I was reading and doing research for the show, I'm coming across articles, and the articles these are published in really big uh, corporations. Uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, uh, a bunch of different barons, a bunch of different um, magazines that are out there and, and public resources. There are people rely on them as public resources. And they really need to start fact-checking these things. <laughs> it is mind-boggling, the, uh, the kind of stuff that gets printed and just how wrong it is. And in fact, I, I'm pretty sure it's, they're probably using uh, AI for this because that's, you know, I, I can't see anybody that spent any time at all covering economics and financial markets making the mistakes that these guys are making. It's just mind-boggling. So... I feel bad for the public. Uh, it's very difficult to get pretty good information. I, I I can give an example about what I was talking about, and this actually showed up. Yeah, uh, I better not mention their name. <laughs> I might get in trouble, but uh, anyway, it's a very respected publication, and it's talking about the yield curve and why uh, the financial. By the way, they use a lot of language. You have to sit there and, and get out a dictionary if you haven't been doing this for a long time uh, to look up. And uh, here's this one paragraph. Yields on long-dated bonds, those are basically bonds that mature more than 20 years now, are far below those on short-dated bonds. Okay. Long-dated bonds are 30-year bonds. Short-dated bonds would be anything from three months to two years. Uh, and the three that what they're pointing out is that the, the bonds that are going to mature in three months to two years are paying more than the bonds that are out there that aren't going to mature for 30 years. Okay. And uh, this is where the, the next line gets me. Okay, so they they were they tell you that yields in long dated bonds are far below those of short dated bonds in what is known as an inverted yield curve. That means if you drew a graph and you put the two-year bond rate interest rates up there, then you put the 30-year bond interest rates, they're going down. They're going down to the right okay, on the graph. So the longer you go, the less you're getting. Uh, that does not make sense. That is the exact opposite of what should be happening, which is why they're calling it the inverted yield curve. If you didn't know that before, now you do. Uh, anyway. The next line, investors expect a lot of rate cuts, which has historically almost always been followed by a recession. That is uh, um, not true. <laughs> I mean, it, when you get rate cuts, when, when interest rates start going down, uh, it causes people to have a tendency to look for other things. It makes cars cheaper, interest rates drop. It makes uh, interest on housing go down. So 
if you were close to qualifying before for a loan before, now that they're going to be able to lend money at a lower interest rate, uh, you're going to be able to afford it um, more. So the activity picks up, not going down. And uh, that's it. Just kills me uh, that they put this out. They're respectable publication, and the person that's writing this is obviously a journalist and not an economist, and uh, or a money manager for that matter. So makes it really tough uh, on advisors. And, and I'll tell you what else makes uh, things tough on advisors. So I'm looking, if you look at stock markets in general, right now the valuations on uh, large cap stocks, that category has done the best over the past five and 10 years now, uh, which makes a lot of people want to run and jump into it. Uh, I'm not sure how quick I would be because oftentimes, that leads to overvaluation, which is kind of where we are now. Uh, a lot of the large cap stocks like the Googles, Amazons, they're, they're ahead of where they should be. It, it's not like it was in the year 2000, uh, and it's not like 2008. So, uh, But they are selling slightly at, at elevated. I mean, when I say elevated, what that means is they're selling at prices that they shouldn't be selling at right now. But it's not that bad. You give them one or two years, and with the current growth rate, that's the other thing that's highly unusual about this economy and got a bunch of economists scratching their heads. Uh, the underlying growth rates in certain industries, and those industries are huge, uh, make up a big percentage of the overall economy, that the growth rates in those areas is you know, double digit. Uh, so when they say it's different this time, they're really right. <laughs> this is really different. I, I can't point out to one area where I'd say, okay, that, that looks like a really undervalued area. Most of them are right about where they should be, which is fine. Uh, if they're where they should be and you still have continued growth, then you should be fine. If you're looking at the next 10 years, not the next, next two or three, uh, then I think you're going to be fine. But Depending on your age, you know, if you are above the age of 60, I would probably have a fairly significant portion of my money into a short-term bond fund uh, or short-term bonds. I, I I have a tendency to like the funds better as I get older because I see the ones that I'm using have uh, done very, very well as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the amount of effort that it takes to actually beat that return is enormous. It's a long run for a very short slide, in my opinion. Uh, you're going to have to um, – it's just an awful lot of effort. And there's a really good chance that you're not going to do it, that investing in this, these shorter-term bond funds right now. If, if you've got a fund that has an average maturity of more than two years right now, I'm not – I don't think I would want to be holding on to that because the uh, longer-term bonds are paying less. And uh, at some point in time, you know, at, if interest rates continue to climb, that might not be that good. If they start to cut interest rates, you'll be fine. You know, you'll actually be fine. But they only cut interest rates typically when the country, when the country's in a recession uh, and in response to a recession. And right now, when you look at the GDP growth that's out there, uh, I'm amazed that it's as high as it is, uh, quite frankly, with all this stuff that's going on in the world. That just shows how resilient the United States economy is. And when these other things around the world start to calm down or, or come, uh, yeah, get closer to the end of whatever it is that they're going to get to, mainly the uh, the word in the between Ukraine and Russia, that's where all the eyes are focused. And, and it holds up a tremendous amount of worldwide uh, economic production. And uh, so at some point in time, that gets settled one way or another. And I'm, like I said, I'm amazed that things are going as well as they are, given the fact that, you know, that's a pretty big conflict. And uh, could end up escalating. It doesn't look like it is right now, but that could change. And that's one of the reasons when you're looking at your portfolios, I'm not sure you want to have 
as much money as you have in the past, you know, 10 or 15 years into stock funds to begin with. First of all, they're not super cheap. They're, in other words, they're not super undervalued. And they, uh, uh, the growth rate's very good. Uh, they're not super overvalued, especially if you get down in the small cap area. Uh, small and mid cap are, are, have better valuations than the large caps do. Um, so that's a good thing. But, uh, you know, you've got another uh, whole bunch of other stuff that's going on worldwide, in, uh, which, incidentally, is why they change interest rates. They look at uh, what's going on outside the world because it does have an impact on the United States. Now, if you look at the companies in the S&P 500, uh, large, you take off the, the top 100 stocks in there and, and roughly half their revenue is generated outside the United States. So when there's, you know, when you've got wars going on outside the United States, that slows everything down. And if you're getting a, a significant source of your income from places outside the United States, well, guess what? That's, that's going to put pressure. That's going to slow down business. Not the end. It just slows it down. Stocks have a tendency to, to overreact to everything. And it's not actually the stocks, it's the people that are investing in them. Uh, they, they like to run around a lot in uh, chase performance quite often uh, instead of sitting down and saying, okay, well, where are the values now? How am I going to uh, take advantage of that? Um, what should I be investing in for fixed income? Uh, fixed income, like I said, I've got a a favorite bond fund that I like. And uh, I can't give you the symbol over the air because, you know, there's just so many rules and regulations in my industry against doing some, something like that. And I'm not even, uh, I'm just not going there. But you can call me and uh, I can send you out some information on it. Uh, it's not a problem. Just shoot out an email. So the fixed income that I, uh, a fund that I like, uh, that I'm using in my own accounts and accounts for our clients, uh, it's done very well for us over time, and uh, and I like it. Uh, the other thing I like a lot in that area are the uh, fixed index annuities. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. They, the rates on those have actually gone up, uh, which is really nice. And uh, I, I think I'll probably try to continue to invest in one of these each year until I uh, reach retirement age. That would be uh, awesome. So and right now the rates I. I'm looking at somebody who's 66. Why did I pick that? Well, because you have to wait 12 months to turn the income on. And uh, they, in my favorite annuity product out there, you got to wait 12 months, and then you can turn it on. Uh, and you don't have to. If you don't turn it on, the guaranteed income that you'll get for your lifetime goes up each year based on how many years you've held it. So that's good. And uh, they've got a, a, a guaranteed schedule of 10 years, and it's pretty substantial. In fact, somebody that was 66 today that looks, hey, I'm 67, I can start taking Social Security. I think I'm going to do that. Uh, I might like to have other guaranteed sources of income for retirement. Well, if you put 100000 in today, uh, 12 months from now, you'd be able to take out $7,154 for as long as you lived. And that's pretty good. Um, if you're a married couple, uh, you'd use the youngest person's age, but you'd both be guaranteed that for as long as you, uh, I, as long as either one of you live. That's one of the things I like about this. I think it's a little bit simpler. Other pro that whole this whole area of annuities is complicated. Uh, it's extremely complicated, and but once you get your arms around everything. You start looking at comparing. This is one of my favorite products because ultimately I feel like it's a little simpler. You're still going to need help. You'll still need somebody to explain the benefits, uh, the, what happens if you want to cash it in, what happens if you die, all those things. Before you, you, know, before you sign a contract, you want to make sure that you have a pretty good understanding of it. And that's one of the things that we do as advisors, go through and explain each of these benefits, each of the uh, uh, areas, for example, uh, it has a penalty if, if you take the money out completely, if you just cash out of it. And I believe this one goes for nine years. Um, 
it goes down over that nine year time period eventually it's not there uh, you can take out more you can take out up to ten percent of the money without any penalty so if you have an emergency you could go in and say look I got to take out ten percent this is what I need to use it for fine you can do that uh, without paying a penalty on it uh, if Somebody in, under certain situations, somebody dies. There's no penalty. Um, like I said, it, there's a lot of stuff to it. But the main thing to keep in mind is, you know, if you're 66, you're going to retire next year because you get full Social Security. Put a hundred thousand dollars in next year. That that income is going to be guaranteed at seven thousand one hundred fifty-four dollars for as long as you live. Uh, if your spouse is uh, your age or older, then they'll guarantee you can name them as a joint annuitant, and it'll go on for both of your lives. That's pretty cool. Anyway, if you put it off until age 68, the number goes up to 7,824. If you put it off until 69, the number goes 8,541. So actually, Nationwide's got a website. That's where I'm reading this from. And if you would like a copy of, or, or would like the uh, address of that website, just feel free to, to reach out to me, Bill at Bullington Capital, or you can go to my website. This is my this is my favorite fixed index product. There's a bunch of them out there, uh, tons of companies out there. There's a lot of reasons, but I don't want to bore you with all that stuff any more than I already have. <laughs> so if you can uh, shoot me an email, I can send you a link. You can go in and put your own numbers in there and play around with the uh, uh the illustration software, it, I think it's a really good product. And outside of fixed index annuities, then that's when I would go to fixed income, the tr more traditional route, like that fund that I was talking about. And I just uh, have been told I've only got about uh, 40 more seconds before I have to take a real quick commercial break. So I will tell you my name is Bill Bullington, if you're just tuning in. And uh, Bullington Capital is my website. If you hear anything you want more information on, you can go to the website and reach out to us there, or you can call us 330-664-0700, 330-664-0700, and I'd be glad to get to whatever types of information that you uh, found that you needed. But uh, at any rate, I'm going to take a real quick commercial break, and this is Bill Bullington right here on 1420, so stay tuned because I will be right back. When I think of the roads I've walked and the way you've brought me through Looking back every step, every breath, I can see your heart is true Thank you. <clears throat> hey, this is Bill Bullington. <laughs> Might have heard the uh, uh, conversation between me and the uh, operator and the producer of the show, but uh, sorry about that. Anyway. We were talking at the beginning of the show about the GDP and the economy. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm going to repeat this uh, because I like to repeat myself often, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> GDP has been much more resilient than I would have predicted. And it's not I'm not alone. And there are a ton of people that thought that the recession was going to be significantly higher uh or stronger than it is now, and you know what? It it really hasn't been that bad. Here's one thing, though: when you're looking and listening to news, the news is not there to help you. The news is there to get your attention, because if they can get your attention, they can sell ads. Okay, so you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, the news is not your friend. It, it's there to get your attention, <laughs> and uh, that attention is very valuable. If they can get you to read their web page or go to their television channel or pick up their magazine, uh, they will or listen to their podcast. You know, they get paid by the number of people that are viewing that material. Uh, so you just have to be careful there. Uh, people say, you know, this, this is true. Uh, and I'm going to start with the Russell Midcap Index. Okay, so the Russell Midcap Index this year started out, and it's up about 10.2%. And people go, what? 
10.2%, I'm still below where I was two or three years ago. And yes, that is true. So is the Russell Midcap Index. (laughs) In fact, it's down about 11.5%, down 11.5% from where it was in 2021. Okay, what year is it again? That's my point. I get this all the time, and, and it's the media's fault. You know, they, and you just have to know that their goal is not to give you the best information. Their goal is to get your attention. And, uh, well, it's just, the, uh, I don't know. That, that, that's a topic for another. You could do an entire series on that. But anyway, so in, in January of 2023, Russell Midcap Index, index was 12, it's actually up 12.6% since that time period, but it's down from 2021, 11.6. See what I'm saying there? See how misleading that could be? Even the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 actually this year, okay, they're showing that it's up 20% this year. Yeah, but it also peaked in 2021, and it's 5.5% below the level that it was two years ago. Now, it's a long time. And by the way, it was down a lot more than that 2022. I can see people were really upset. But now as this is climbing and clawing its way back uh, the, uh, to its old former high, people, the, the news, the media is out there telling you, oh, hey, the market." It's a new one-year high. And, uh, well, yeah, but see, the market peaked two years ago, a little over two years ago. And uh, so it's not back to where it had gotten to, but that's, they know that's not what you're hearing. They know what you're hearing is all-time new high, and it's not an all-time new high. It's a one-year new high. Uh, so you have to pay, pay very close attention to that. Otherwise, psychologically, I've seen a lot of people just get ruined over that because they think they're underperforming. They're probably not. They're probably within 1% or 2% of that average if they're doing things right anyway. And, uh, and if not, they're not going to be too far off of it. And here, here's the other thing you have to keep in mind. If you have fixed income in your account, it's not going to keep up with the stock market. Um, you know, there, there's no way. It just in the long run... Well, I shouldn't say there's no way. It it hasn't kept up with the stock market. There are very few times where you can go out and buy bonds or fixed income investments who have returns that will beat the market's long-term averages. That, that almost never happens. That's one of the reasons that I like the fixed indexed annuities. I know what the returns are there. I know how they're doing it. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's a good idea. Somebody who's at 66 years old next year is going to be able to looking to take some income from it. They're going to guarantee $7,154 for the rest of your life, no matter what happens to the stock market. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good rate of return. And I'm going to tell you the vast majority of people who are investing in stocks today because they're going to pull out when they go through a period where there's an extended down period where the market's down a lot and it takes three, four, five, six years to recover from, you know, that's fine if you're in your 40s. Uh, if you're in your, even in your early 50s, okay? but if you're in your mid-50s and above, maybe you don't want all of your money in stocks despite the fact that it's going to have a really good long-term return. The shorter term returns, the more money you put in safer stuff, the more the returns are going to come down by. Uh, but, it prevents you from having a period of 10 years with really negative returns, the way that it would have happened to you had you retired in March of 2000. March of 2010 comes along, and you're still down a lot from where you started 10 years ago. Hopefully you're not – and by the way, that's if you weren't taking any money out. If you had to supplement your income, you've got a problem. I mean, that's a big problem. So that's one of the reasons that I started looking at the uh, fixed index products several years ago. Now, prior to several years ago, 
I wasn't that interested in them. They didn't guarantee nearly as high of, the, of returns as they're guaranteeing today, uh, and they weren't quite as flexible as they are. So I, uh, uh, I'm always saying that you know the only thing in constant in life is change, and they've changed. They've, they've come around, and now I think they make a lot of sense for an awful lot of people. Somebody who's never invested in stocks, not, uh, you know, it gets to retirement age and has a whole bunch of money um, just sitting in passbook savings accounts. That this is probably a pretty good option for a portion of their money. And uh, uh, and by the way, that's another issue that I'd like to bring up. There's no one right way to do anything, and but there is a right way for you. And I'm very fond of that uh, idea is that you need to sit down and talk to somebody about this. I don't care who you talk to. Hopefully there's somebody that that has some experience in the industry, um, financial advisor of some type, and uh, you want to have them have your best interest at heart. Uh, I'm a registered investment advisor. I have to do what's in your best interest. It's the law. So if if I want to keep my practice, the uh, I've got to we've got to discuss it. Got to go down in writing. Um, the applications that you fill out are forty to sixty pages. They want to make sure that you know you know what you're doing now, which is uh, uh, unusual. Well, that stuff has not has only come about in the past ten years or so, but the uh, should have been there from the very beginning. And uh, uh, yeah, but you just want to know that your advisor is listening to what you're saying and trying to repeat back to you uh, what it is that you're trying to achieve and then shows you, you know, some various options and then lets you pick. You know, that's that's the key is uh, I can, you can lay out options for everybody. Some people may not understand a lot of things at first or there's this miscommunication or uh, they just don't like it you know, and that's fine. So we try to hit all the bases. Uh, here's something that's got complete liquidity. That means, what does that mean? That means you could cash it in in a day. Okay? That's complete liquidity. You could sell everything in one day. You could be back to cash in a day. That If, if liquidity is the most important part to you, uh, then that's the type of portfolio you want. If you're looking to... Uh, grow the assets and are willing to put up with more fluctuation and you don't mind not being able to cash it in immediately uh, without a penalty, that's where you're going to bring in other types of investment. Now, exchange-traded funds, by the way, one of the reasons I use them is uh, one of the reasons I left to start my own practice, you know, holy cow, it's going to be, it was, yeah, that's amazing. It's going to be 20 years next year. Holy cow. I've been in the industry a lot longer than that, but I went to go out and do this on my own almost 20 years ago now. And time really flies. <laughs> but uh, but at any rate, I wanted to do what I felt like was the right thing for my clients. And when I saw the returns that they were generating on their own uh, and trying to pick stocks, Uh, And managing stocks, back in those days, it it was a lot easier than it is today to manage stocks. You have way more choices today. Uh, Even though you have more choices, the number of funds that have grown um, have kind of had an impact on how the stock market actually works. And uh, individual stocks are just a whole lot more volatile. The whole market's faster today than it was 20 years ago. So that's a big change. And I remember, I think there were 12 exchange-traded funds at that time. That's what I wanted to use for a portion of the money uh, that I was investing for people. And uh, now there are several thousand. Uh, And if you can think of an idea, whether it's good or bad, (laughs) uh, there's a fund out there that's doing it. And uh, I see it's mind-boggling. But... Another reason that I would uh, probably try to take some time to talk with an advisor because, you know, I've been doing this from the get-go, and uh, there's a lot of experience there. There's a lot of uh, uh, studying. We're still studying. In fact, I study every day. Um, I enjoy it, though. You know, for me, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I know what the differences in factors 
can have uh, over time. And what, what is a factor? A factor is just something that a fund manager decides that they're going to focus on and they're going to include in their list of items a stock or a bond must have, or any financial instrument, must have to be included. So maybe you're only going to take the top 10% of stocks by size. That means, uh, or capitalization, that's the size, that's the, the amount of uh, money invested in the stock of your firm. So if your stock, your firm's got a billion dollars, a billion shares outstanding and stock's selling at 10 bucks a share, uh, that's $10 billion. That's, that's the capitalization. That could be a factor in uh, profitability. We're going to take your sales minus your uh, uh, all your expenses and take that number before you pay taxes on it. Uh, they call it pre-tax income. Uh, and we like to see companies that are very profitable. So maybe that number's got to be uh, in the top 10% of all stocks. Right? So, And basically what these guys are doing uh, is putting together a mathematical formula for picking stocks and managing that fund. And that's a really good method, incidentally. I love that method. In fact, it was the main reason I left to in my own firm all that time ago because I wanted to be able to do that and there were no there were very few options available at that time. Now there are tons of options. You know, and uh, the problem with today is there are so many of them, so many thousands of them, uh, getting to know them and reading the, through the prospectuses, trying to figure out which funds are doing what, is a full-time job. <laughs> Never mind all the ones that are coming that are new, uh, and never mind all the ones that are coming that are, you know, they're just not going to be that good. Uh, I forget. I think, I can't remember how many people have lost in the money in something like Bitcoin. And understanding Bitcoin uh, is really tough. There have been some extremely large portfolio managers that lost a fortune in that stuff. I mean, and I, you would think that. Sheesh, you, you'd think they would know better than that. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm always surprised. That's, that's the other thing I, I kind of like about my job is that you look out and you see something, okay, that shouldn't work that way. No, those guys know better than that. And, and then you find out that you don't. So that's one of the reasons that I, I like products that are relatively simple. Fixed income in our fixed index annuities, um, my favorite. Uh the, the chance, by the way, and this, this is how most of them are marketed. Well, you get the fixed rate or you get the rate of the investments, whichever is higher. And that's true. They don't tell you is that the fixed rates or the guarantees are typically so high that the underlying investments that you're making after you pay out all the fees and stuff are probably not going to do better than the guarantee. Okay? And that's that's Bill Bullington's take on that industry. And uh, he can take it for what it, whatever you feel like that's worth. But my, uh, my point of view is that you should look at the guarantees as if that's going to be the maximum. In most cases, it will be. So what do you want to do in that case? Well, you want to find the, the contracts that have the highest guarantees. And it, it's not easy. I'm telling you. Yeah. Hey, it's unbelievable the amount of complexity that goes into this stuff. And, you know, in the old days, it it started off a lot easier than that. And then it just got more and more complicated. So I've just been told I have a, uh, only a few seconds before I have to take a commercial break. Listen, if you'd like to call and talk about your situation, feel free to go to my website, BullingtonCapital.com. There's a contact us page there. Uh, my phone number is all over the website. You can call us, and we would be glad to call you back. Um, when I come back, I think I'm going to take the last 15 minutes and just go over the individual stocks. I mean, I used to do that a lot more, and, and I get a lot of requests for it. Uh, it's kind of fun, and uh, I wouldn't take it uh, too seriously, but I'll explain more about what I, what I mean about that after I come back from these commercial messages. I saw mercy. Mercy seated where the judge should be was guilty. Guilty. 
guilty and getting out of jail free. I could be a didn't get the life I deserve. Well, welcome back. This is Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. Um, you can find out more about me by going to my website at bullingtoncapital.com. There's a contact us page there if you'd like me to reach out and call you, or you can just call the office. It's 330-664-0700. And I'd be glad to talk to you about uh, anything you've heard on this show, any other questions that you have. Um, one of the nice things about having been in this business for so long, I have a ton of really nice clients. I mean, they're just uh, nice people. And uh, we are a fiduciary, which means we're obligated to operate in your best interest. Um, so we'll discuss whatever it is you'd like to discuss. I'll lay out several options that, because there's never just one way. Well, hard, I shouldn't say just, I shouldn't say never, but there's rarely, extremely rarely, just one particular option that, that will solve whatever problems you have. Uh, vast majority of the time there are multiple. And that's one of the difficulties about this industry and just financial planning in general. You, you <laughs> Basically, you could do whatever you'd like to do. I mean, there are, are some ways that are definitely going to be more productive uh, given your time horizon, your age, your risk, all that kind of stuff. The, um, and then there, uh, yeah, so in other words, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat to uh, age myself on a, on a thing that nobody ever uses anymore. But anyway, I was looking at the, uh, uh, this is what got me, to, and I own one of these, by the way. By the way, incidentally, they've raised the rates now. I mean, so if you're getting into a uh, fixed index annuity, you're actually doing better than I am. Uh, which is fine. I'm I'm happy with my uh, rate that I'm getting. Completely happy. Still higher than what CD rates are. But uh, again, that somebody who is 66 wants to start taking full social security next year and wants to have some other income for every hundred thousand dollars that you put into one of these, it, it, you don't have to put in a hundred thousand dollar minimum. But it's just easier for me to do the math. Uh, you'd end up getting seven thousand one hundred fifty-four dollars in lifetime income guaranteed until you die. Uh, one of the things, again, that I like about this one that some others don't have is that if you die before the money is spent, the remainder goes to your beneficiaries. That's kind of a big deal. A lot of them didn't have that feature several years ago, which is one of the reasons I didn't like using it. Um, one of the reasons I didn't use it. So at any rate, if you want more information on that, just feel free to give me a call and uh, we can talk about it. Um, we're not a... We, we apply no pressure to anybody. Um, I am a fiduciary. I'm required, literally, to act in your best interest by law. So, uh, and, and uh, I take that pretty serious. Uh, I'm, I'm typically more concerned with my clients understanding everything that they're doing and being comfortable with it than just about anybody I know, <laughs> because I don't want you upset. You know, five, ten years from now, when something happens that you didn't expect. That, that's the other thing, expectation. I'm going to help you work on the expectation. And uh, so I'm going to leave that stuff alone now because I only have a, a few minutes here, about 10, 10 more minutes before I have to sign off. And I've got a lot of people that uh, still like to talk about individual stocks. I get it. You know, I still run my scan every single day. I, I can't wait until we can do another seminar so I can kind of show you the up grades that the software that I use has made, um, kind of aggravating actually, <laughs> always having to upgrade your knowledge, that is, that, that's fatigue. You know, I'm, we're doing it constantly. Everybody that we deal with uh, is using newer software than they had, you know, three or four years ago. So um, they call the software that financial advisors use their tech stack. So our tech stack is changing fairly frequently, and you've got to go in and study and learn how to use it. So uh, anyway, I feel bad for the average person out there that, that doesn't like dealing with computers, because when you like it a lot, it's still a lot of work. So anyway, here's what I have. 
this this is the scan. This is my favorite scan. This is the one I look at uh, on a daily basis, uh, at least for 15 minutes a day. That, that's the least amount of time I'm generally looking at it. So the criteria that I use are it's all stocks traded in a, on a New York Stock Exchange. Their price to sales ratio has to be less than 10. Uh, I'm not going to worry about explaining what that is. It's just a valuation tool. Uh, over the past three months, the relative strength, that means how much has it gone up relative to all other stock in that universe. Uh, it's got to be 90 or better. So it's had to outperform 90% of all stocks over the past 90 days. It's also got to be making a 30-day high in price. So uh, it doesn't have to be a one-year, two-year, something like that. 30 days is fine by me. If the stock is up in the uh, top 10% of all performers, what I just described was the uh, uh, had a relative strength ranking of 90. 90 means it's outperformed 90%, which means it's in the top 10%. But I just thought I would explain what that was. Also, I like to see that the volume is above its average daily volume. So not only is the stock going up, but the ink the days that it's going up, it's increasing the, the amount of shares that are being traded. So I just take that list and I run through it, and then I rank them uh, based on valuation. And I'm looking at the companies. Normally, I would use a price. Uh, per share of, uh, I don't like to buy stocks that are under 10 bucks because it's just, they're, they're too wild. Uh, you can lose a whole lot of money much faster on a cheap stock than you will on a stock that's 100 bucks or over 100 bucks. And since nobody's charging commissions, what do you care if it's 5 bucks or 10 bucks? I'm telling you, the stocks under 5 bucks are significantly more difficult. But hey, you know, it, I'm not here to tell you what you have to do. I'm here to give you some ideas on what best thing you might be. Anyway, there's the uh, pretty good looking uh, stocks. When I look at across, I've been seeing a lot of healthcare stocks in the last three, four weeks. Um, United Airlines came up. That was a little bit uh, unusual for me. Uh, there's some software stocks that are coming up. Most of these stocks are relatively inexpensive, so I probably wouldn't recommend that you take large positions in small company stocks because when the stock is under three bucks, when it's under five bucks, uh, it does not have to move very much for you to lose a lot of money. And let me give you an example. So there's a, uh, let's see where this one is. Okay, as soon as I said that, of course, Data Storage Corporation, the chart looks really good on this, but the share price is $2.92. And I'm sure they're in some sort of hardware or software business with a name like Data Storage Corporation. I don't, don't even know what they do yet, but uh, I'm looking at the chart. It looks good. It was up a lot, closing the upper half of that day's range. Uh, it's under 3 bucks, and, and I know a lot of people are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going, yeah, no, no, those, those are really hard to trade because that thing only has to drop 20 cents and it's down 10%. <laughs> so if that makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, the price of sales ratio is 0.56, which is relatively low depending on what the industry is, uh, but that's relatively low for just about any industry. Um, and the next seminar that I do, I'm going to go through this again because I've actually hit some big, pretty big home runs doing this. Most of the time... Uh, two out of three times, you end up losing money on trading. Uh, but 30% win ratio can be really, really uh, profitable if you're cutting your losses quickly enough. You, know, you, you can actually you can lose on nine out of ten and still be profitable. So if you're if you're winning on one out of three because you're cutting your losses very quickly, you can be extremely profitable, and that's typically the where the averages are and this company next and since I brought it up I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and trade this in my trading account. I will put the trade in on Monday. Hear that Gary, you gotta trade for me. <laughs> Gary's he's the guy that does the trading in the office. Uh and uh, I'll tell him what I want to buy and how many shares and, and goes ahead and does it for me in, in my own account. <laughs> That's how lazy I am now. But uh anyway, 
this company is called World Acceptance Corporation. It's a financial services company. I think they uh, they extend credit uh, credit cards. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I don't really care because this is not a long term investment. This is a trade. See, that's they are different, and where a lot of people get that wrong is you do not want to turn a trade into a long term investment. What that means is you had no plan. You bought it because you heard somebody like me talking about it and you had no exit strategy. <laughs> if it's an investment and it gets overvalued by at least 50%, if it's 50% overpriced, I'm going to let the stock go. So if it's a trade and it drops 10% below my purchase price, I'm out. See ya. That was a trade, not an investment. And a lot of people have a tough time differentiating that and they try to apply the rules to from investing to trading, and, and it just doesn't work that way. So there are two entirely different things. Uh, and, and again, there are, yeah, two entirely different things. So anyway, World Acceptance has a nice-looking chart. Uh, it's about 150 bucks a share, and people go, oh, I don't know, I can't buy that many shares. No, you can't. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> just stick your 10% stop loss under there and it'll be in good shape. Anyway, the, the symbol on that is WRLD. And it's got a nice looking chart. Uh, it's at 150 bucks. And just beginning, the last part of uh, 2021, it was 256. So it was significantly higher than that. And, uh, and let me go on through here. There's a Bragg Gaming Group. Uh, not sure what this is, but the description says technology sectors, gaming, multimedia, uh, Elon, there's an animal health incorporated. In. I'm not sure what that is. I only have a few seconds here. I'm not going to go through there. But by the way, there were a couple of solar companies that came up, which I thought was interesting. There were actually three or four of them. Now that I hear the music, that means I have to take a real quick. I don't know. That means the show's over. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is Bill Bullington. Stay tuned. I'll be back next week at 11 o'clock. Have a good weekend. Good, le- good investing and good luck. just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.